Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is Deborah Mills. She is a caregiver for her mom, and she has written a children's book called Granny Needs Help. And we're going to chat a little bit about her journey with caregiving, the book, but then we have a special guest coming in in a little bit. So thanks for joining me, Deborah. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Awesome. So you're still, tell us about your mom. You're still caring for mom. Absolutely. I'm still caring for mom. Mom first started showing signs of, you know, dementia, something's going on probably around 2003 or so you know, getting kind of that formal diagnosis around 2005, 2006, but it's been a while. It's, it's been, that's a good 18 years now. You're, you're right up there with me. My mom had Alzheimer's for at least 20. I think wow. she started showing signs in 96, but not ones that you would be aware of. Like it was more, when you look back, you're like, yeah, the, those orders that she was taking with no details <laughs> that's probably mm-hmm, a sign mm-hmm. so right yeah right. so she had it a long time and if she hadn't fallen and broken her leg she probably would still be with us so wow fortunately you know she always said things work out for a reason which always drove me insane but she was right <laughs> <laughs> yeah mom had a point mom yeah, had a she, good point she did i'm still trying to learn to, to let life you know like, I'm trying to figure out what post-pandemic life is supposed to look like for me, and I realized I was putting on artificial deadlines for figuring that out, so just mm-hmm. letting all that go. Mm-hmm. So when did mom move in with you? So you said she started showing signs in 03, diagnosed mm-hmm. in 05, this is 21. Poof. When did she move in with you? Well, really, she just moved in with me a couple of years ago with my husband and I, But what happened first was I would go to her house to take care of her every day. Every day, that was my journey, go up there to take care of her. She lived maybe 20 minutes away. Um, And my father needed help also. He um, had a massive stroke, so he was paralyzed. So he needed help. And, you know, there came a point when I realized, oh, she can't take care of him anymore. So when I realized she couldn't take care of him, then I ended up moving up there. And I lived with them and I would try to come home on the weekend. I've got like the best, most understanding husband in the world, but that is what we did for, for several years. Oof. I've read a lot of people that do that. And it's like, I don't know, that, that was not something I think I could have done. So I, I admire that you could do that and your husband for sharing you that way. Yeah, for us, it was two of them and they both needed extensive care. So we didn't have the room in our home to bring both of them in. So that's how I ended up, you know, going up there and staying. And there was one day I would call my mom every night and say, okay, mommy, I would, I would put out the medicine before I left. I put my dad's in one place. I put hers in a separate place. And then I'd call her and I would walk her through getting the medicine, taking her medicine. And then one night I called, okay, mom, time to get medicine. Let's go get daddy's first. And she goes, you're going to be so proud of me. I said, I am. Yes, you're going to be so proud of me. I took my medicine already. And my heart sank because I knew that was not good. And so she had taken the medicine I left for her and she took the medicine I left for my dad. Oh, geez. And that was the last night that she spent by herself. So I moved in after that because it's like they, they, they can't do it on their own. And poor mom, she was so proud of herself. And and fortunately, you probably didn't burst her bubble, but it's just, that's the hardest thing with this disease. It's like, you know, they they think they're managing and then you got to just like crush their dreams. Exactly. I didn't burst her bubble at all, but then you start calling poison control, call the doctors. What am I supposed to do? You know, but it all worked out and she was fine. <laughs> yeah, fortunately, probably one dose of his stuff probably wouldn't be too bad. But yeah, that must have been a... It must have been a really exciting evening. You probably got a lot of sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So she's, <laughs> how old is mom now? Oh gosh, she will be 80 next month. She is 79. She'll be 80 in May. 
Awesome. We had a couple May birthdays in our family. So what prompted you, you know, you only have a few things going on in your life. What prompted you to write a children's book? I I just felt like it was our story and I wanted to write our story out. It was more so kind of a um a self-care thing for me. Let me just get this out. And so I wrote our little story and when I read it back to Jose, she was so in awe, you know, her little eyes got big and I'm like, "Okay, well maybe maybe I have something here." Um so it was really just uh just sort of a an act of self-care for me. Let me write this, get it out. And it was also a way to kind of put my mom's name down in paper, kind of seal her legacy, so to speak. That's really cool. And Jose, for those people who didn't figure it out, is the granddaughter. So she's the yes. great granddaughter of your mom. And you, yes. you take care of the grandkids. Well, I know when we talked a month or so ago, you took care of the grandkids during the week. Was that a pandemic thing or... You're always helping out with the grandkids too. It's a pandemic thing. Okay. You know, with the pandemic, I have one little guy, he's three and his daycare provider was like, nope. She shut down the whole daycare when pandemic started with, with no reopen date. It's like, I'm done. <laughs> and so I have him so his parents can go to work. And then Jose, um, schools are closed here. They just open back up and the kids can go two days a week. So now she's in school two days a week. And then we do virtual schooling on the other days. And you're in the D.C. area, correct? Yes, I'm in the D.C. metro area. I'm actually in Fairfax County, which is right outside of D.C. Okay. And so I'm in the San Francisco Bay area. And I think, I know the high schools started back up a couple weeks ago or thereabouts. This is April 8th. And... I don't know. My daughter's almost 30, so I don't have to worry about the schools anymore. But yeah, they were out of school for over a year. And I feel yes. very, very badly for the class of 2021 because they did not have a senior year. <laughs> they might, no, not they might have all. had a not senior all, quarter. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, not thought, at all. Well, I thought the class of 2020 kind of got a little, you know, beat around, but at least they had three quarters of a senior mm-hmm. year. They just didn't have a graduation. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a time. <laughs> it has. It has. It's been a time. And fortunately, Zay is small. So she kind of changes as things change. She's not set in her ways. And so for the little people, it's not quite as bad, I don't think, as it is for the older ones. You know, but she's she's two days a week and she's tired now after those two days because she hasn't been in the classroom, you know, for a year. That's crazy. So hopefully when... They can go back full time, quote unquote, normal, whatever that's going to look like. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, you'll be able to take the book and maybe share it with her classes, or she could take it. That would be nice. That would be very nice. So, I've had conversations recently about living well with dementia. I personally mm-hmm. think, and training might be the wrong term, but I don't know of a better one right now. I've been on the Zoom a lot today, so <laughs> my brain is a little a little squishy, but. I think if we educate is a better term, the younger people on this is Alzheimer's and it's not a scary thing, although it kind of is, but you know, and it's, it happens, it's not normal, but it's not, you know, we don't need to be afraid of grandma. We don't need to be, you know, we don't need to like stick grandma in the corner or we don't need to avoid Mm -hmm. her. I'd really think that would help with, keeping them engaged, the older adults and, and giving the young people a little bit of a purpose. There is slash was, I did, they, I don't know if they're reopened at all. It's a private a church that has daycare and preschool. And then after mm-hmm. they have the older kids after school, and then they have an adult day program. And in the morning they'd bring over the preschoolers and the kindergartners to interact with the older adults. Mm-hmm. And, some of them could read to the kids because they're young enough. The books were easy. And then in the afternoon, the um, older students, like the third, fourth graders, would come over and, and interact with the the older adults. And sometimes they could help with a little bit of homework. And a lot of times the kids would help like with art projects and and games and stuff. And it was just kind of mm-hmm. like free grandparent time. It was like yeah. adopted grandparents 
And what I loved about this program is when I talked to their director, the kids benefited, the older adults benefited, but the sandwich generation caregiver person who wasn't present, because they're running around trying to keep the world going, they benefited too because of that interaction with the other two generations. And Mm -hmm. I would love to see a lot more of that. So I'm kind of excited to learn more about your book. And did Jose help with that at all? Yes, Jose was right there the whole time. And, you know, she was, I wrote, but she was more my my editor, the one who would critique <laughs> me, you know. Did it happen like that? Maybe you should say it like this. Or she was more of, of a critique person than, you know, than writing. But she's right there the whole time. Jose has been with me. She doesn't live with me, but at the same time, we live close in proximity. So she's been with me since birth. So that means she's been around her granny since she was born. So she's really good with her and it is an education and a learning process so that they're not afraid. You know, she knows something's a little different, but she's not afraid. Well, she's had a few moments where she was a little bit unsure, but you know, that's when you have a conversation. Mm-hmm. And so she's eight, correct? She's eight. Awesome. So that's, what are, what is her interactions with great grandma like? Um, she's her cheerleader. I can say that, you know, cause she has some trouble walking now. And so I may have to get her up and, you know, Jose's there going, come on, granny, you can do it. Go granny. You know, so she's the cheerleader or if I have to run out of the room for a minute, I'm like, Jose, go check granny, go check on granny, see how she's doing. So she'll run in, she'll come back. Granny's doing well. Even a three-year-old now, he'll do the same thing. You know, LJ, go check on granny. He'll run and check her and come right back. She's doing good, you know. So it's a family effort. It's definitely a family effort. Well, I think if they're going to live with you, that's the only way to do it. And unfortunately, it seems to me that that's not usually what happens. Or I don't know. It just doesn't. You seem to have got it all dialed in. So I'm really impressed. You know, I just I just do my best. That's all I can do. You know, that's all I can do. So. I have them basically four days a week. You know, they come in the morning when their parents go to work and the parents come back and get them in the, in the evening. And so we've, we've all got to do this thing together. You know, the caregiver is here, but we're still all working together. I always considered when my mom was in the memory care that the, the care staff and I, we were all a team for mom. Mm -hmm. And I kind of came to that decision because there was a lot of family members that would complain about this or that you know things that maybe needed to be fixed or adjusted but it's like don't complain they got enough going Mm -hmm. on taking care of your parent Mm -hmm. or your your loved one you know point out that x needs to be addressed but don't complain Mm -hmm. and sometimes some of them would They would almost be a little bit demanding. Can I get a this? Can I get a that? I'm like, they're not here for you. (laughs) You know, it's like, and I think the staff recognized that that was my opinion. I probably, I probably projected that when people were getting a little too pushy. Mm -hmm. We had a great experience because, you know, that was the same thing. It was like, it's going to take all of us to make this, you know, give her, a good quality of life. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I know my sister took her kids. My nephew is on the autism spectrum. And I don't know that he went as often as my niece who is older, Mm -hmm. but that's okay. You know, it's like he had his own struggles and there's only so much you could do. Like you said. And if, if he wasn't able to interact with my mom, my mom was getting really challenging and he did not ever know her when she was good when her mind was fine okay. mm-hmm. um my niece did get a little bit of that but not a lot my daughter is 14 years older than my niece so my my daughter got all the good years which does does present some resentment on the other side but we won't talk about that so <laughs> do you happen to have the book handy i forgot to ask you that before we started recording. I do. oh good she's smart lady I do. <laughs> I do have it right here. It's so cute. And now is the drawing on the front. Is that supposed to be Jose? 
Yes. It's so cute. Yes, and there's Granny sitting in the background. That is adorable. So can we bring in Jose? And I got a couple questions for her. Maybe she can read a couple pages for us. Absolutely. Here Here comes our our star. Hi, Jose. My My name's (laughs) Jennifer, and I'm in California. Oh, that's where Auntie Britt is at. My daughter's in California, too, so she's always FaceTiming and talking to her auntie on the phone. Awesome. So your grandma says that you were a very big help in writing the book, you said that you were the editor and made sure she got it all correct. Speak up loudly. Yes. yes. Yeah. So <laughs> what, what, did, what do you think of the book? Do you like it? Yes. Yes? I like it. Do you ever yeah, read when she it? saw her name in print, she started dancing. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever read it to your great grandma? Sometimes. Sometimes. And then, so can you tell me what is it you like to do to help your grandma with your great grandma? I like to tell her she's sliding out the chair. <laughs> no, she <laughs> <When> she slides. <laughs> That's we a, had to get Granny a seatbelt. Oh, funny! That's important. <laughs> it's very, mm-hmm. it's very helpful that you're you're a help to your grandma. Um, what do other activities that you like to do with great grandma? Got to keep everybody straight Sometimes here. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we color. Once she colored on the table. <laughs> I bet you you did that when you were little. <laughs> yeah, I think we all probably did. Mm-hmm. And then, mm-hmm. does your little brother color with you guys? Yes. Yes? That must be nice. He's still learning. Mm-hmm. She has school with him. Mm-hmm. He's still learning. She says he's three. Yeah. So he's still learning to color. Mm-hmm. He probably colors on the table more than great grandma, huh? <laughs> yes, she's nodding her head. Yes. Mm-hmm. She colored on the TV. Oh boy. Mm-hmm. 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 Well, you mm-hmm. know, when it's a blank, it when their mind, you know, sometimes if you look at it kind of through their eyes, some things don't if when your brain isn't quite sure what's going on, you look at maybe a TV might look like a blank piece of paper. <laughs> or the, the table might look like blank paper. Mm-hmm. I know walls mm-hmm. do. <laughs> mm-hmm. Maybe that was the case, huh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so do you want to read us a little bit of your book that Grandma wrote for you and Would Great you like Grandma? Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. You got to read it kind of loudly so everybody can hear well, clearly. Read about the coloring part? Oh, that'd be perfect. Okay, we'll find the page with the coloring. Okay. That'd be a great page. There you go. Okay, sit still. Right. I'll start here. Granny likes to whistle and play with dolls. She colors with crayons too. Sometimes she colors on the table. What can you do? Mommy doesn't get mad. I'm not ashamed when she makes a mess. I just remember she's doing her very best. Yeah. She's doing her very best. Want to read the next page? Okay. I'm not afraid anymore, and I don't get sad or mad so much. I just want Granny to remember. Zay, my name is Zay. Please remember me. I get angry at dementia. And I just want to throw it into the sea. Mm-hmm. Staying mad wouldn't do any good. I just miss all the fun we still have to share. So I choose to be happy even when life isn't fair. She's not like she, she's not like she was because of her brain. Yet she's my granny just the same. Mm-hmm. Very nice. That's awesome. She's my Thank granny you. just the same. <laughs> Good so, job. When, so when you were a little bit younger, did great grandma was she a little bit scary for you? 
I don't know. You don't know? No, not when she was younger. Actually, more so now we've had it because when she was younger, she didn't know any different. It's just this is the way Granny acts. But when she began to get a little bit older, it's like, hmm, why is Granny eating her food with her fingers? Why is Granny doing? So when she got to get a little, when she became a little bit older, then her reasoning skills increased. So as her reasoning and understanding increased, it's like, okay, Granny is not doing things that usually a grandma would do. So it was more so when she was a little bit older. That makes sense. And did did your grandma writing the book help you understand better? We don't know. know. <laughs> I you think as a little person, they were kind of friends because they were doing the same things. You know, when Jose was four, they were both coloring. When, you know, Jose was four, then Jose would show her granny how to take her clothes off at night. And granny would listen. Granny, take your pants off like this. Take your shirt off like that. You know, it's almost like they had a little friendship going. That's that's awesome. See, you were such yeah. a big help. I bet you you're still a big help. Oh, yeah. You are. You're, that's you great. You are. Well, do you have homework you have to go work on? No. No? Okay, you can stay there if you want. Do <laughs> you want to stay here for a minute or you want to go do something else? Oh, she wants to stay here. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Okay. It's nice to talk to t more than one person sometimes. Yeah. So do you yeah. think there's a second book that'll happen? You know, I, I had no idea that this book would make the difference that it has made or that it's making. Um, so I guess it, it, there could be, but I really wrote it for me <laughs> and my mom and Jose. And so to see it take on a kind of a life of its own and that it means something to someone else is amazing because it's not why I wrote it. So something is happening that I never expected. Uh, I spoke with someone just the other day and I wrote an article. She asked me to write a blog um, for an Alzheimer's group. So I did, of course. And I was like, I was in school. She sent it back. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, um, I think you're being a little bit too modest here. Can you beef it up, please? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, beef it up. All right. How do I do that? Because it wasn't a story that I wrote to beef up. It's just really. It's our life. It's what we live every day. So <laughs> it's amazing that, you know, other people see the value in it. So maybe there might be a, a second book. Well, you never know. I'm so always so impressed that caregiver, so many caregivers, or at least I talk to the ones that all do this, create something else. You know, we've gone through this journey or you're still going through the journey. That's enough. That's a big mm -hmm. task. You know, mm -hmm. but you wrote a book and I created a podcast and some people create apps or platforms for other caregivers or I don't know. I can't think of anything else off the top of my head, but you know, it's like there just seems to be this, this desire to create and share instead of like, mm -hmm. oh, that journey's over. Thank goodness. Like, you know, my mom passed away over a year ago and I'm still here talking to people like you guys yeah. because I'm still learning on the caregiving front and so i assume that if i'm learning something that other people will learn things so mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. kind of feedback and stories are you hearing from people that have read the book and shared it with their families you know surprisingly um from adults i have heard that they didn't they didn't know that that's how alzheimer's worked you know still people will say um how do you die from alzheimer's you know, they don't understand that your brain controls everything that you do. So um, I've heard that and just really the just people having no idea, because if you have not experienced this, you don't know. And maybe that's part of the reason that we still do things and go back and do what we do, even though caregiving is full time. I think one, it's an outlet to write or do a podcast or form a group or whatever it is. I think it's an outlet. It's it's a healthy outlet that allows you to express some of the things that you're going through in hopes also that it will help somebody else. And 
then once you've been through it, I'm sure once I'm on the other side of this journey, I'll still want to help somebody else, you know, because lots of times you don't find the help that you need. Like you said, the neurologist told that one young lady, oh, it's not going to bother her. Like, no, duh, because they haven't been through it. And it's no disrespect to doctors or neurologists, but they haven't, most of them have not walked and lived this journey. They have a book knowledge of it, not a, not a day-to-day life knowledge. Yeah, that's true. And everybody's brains and personalities are different. Our biology is all enough different that, you know, one person with an Alzheimer's might tolerate anesthesia just fine and somebody else might wake up from a surgery from anesthesia. And this is some of the horror stories I've heard is that it amplifies all the worst parts of their Alzheimer's mm-hmm. or dementia. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, no, thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we don't need that. Yeah. My mom had to have surgery uh, kind of early on in this process. And I, I learned, you know, no, there's one particular medication and I wish I knew the name of it, but there's a medicine that they give you. Um, they give most people who are having surgery that it knocks you out right away. So you don't ever, you don't know that you roll down to the operating room. You don't remember getting on the table. And it's that particular medication that would cause my mom to have a change in personality. You know, she was like that for a week or so after a surgery. Um, and so I had to say, don't, don't give her that. It does not matter to me that she knows she's rolling down the hall or that she, you know, knows she's getting up on the operating table. Don't give her that. And so when they did not give her that particular drug, she had a different response to the anesthesia. It was that primary or that, you know, I don't even know what to call it, you know, but they don't want you to, they think people have a fear. So it's like, let me give them something to knock them out in this room. So they give you something and as you're rolling down the hallway, you're out. That's a different drug than the anesthesia. That makes sense. I've only had and one that, sur- surgery and yeah, I'm like, well, I was at a surgery center, so I don't even know if they must have moved me, but yeah, I I don't remember any of that. I just remember Yeah, that's the one that that bothered my mom and you know, for a week or so she's a diff- she was a different person. It's like, no. Uh-uh. Yeah, no, we're not. She cool. doesn't get that anymore. <laughs> Never again. <laughs> Mm-mm. That's that's interesting and I think that's a really helpful piece of information to know cuz You have to kind of wonder as we get older, you know, like I mentioned, we had a friend that had both knees replaced and then I don't know if he had a hip replacement, but a third surgery. And that third surgery is the one that his brain never cleared all the chemicals that allow you to have surgery without, you know, Mm -hmm. screaming and having to bite down on a a stick or whatever. And but maybe it was that other drug. And maybe we, you know, if you're not like so. I wasn't afraid to have the surgery. I wasn't particularly interested in having it. I broke my collarbone. Right. So, mm. you know, I, I'm sure I would have been fine if they had just said, well, we don't really want to give you this other one unless we have to. You don't, I've never had a choice. They don't tell you. No, I wasn't aware so, that yeah. there was a pre, a pre yes. <laughs> There is, there is. And so now I tell them, cause I've had to have, you know, a surgery and I say, don't give me that. And so now, I, you know, when I had the surgery, I was awake. I knew that they were rolling me down the hall. I actually helped to put myself up on the operating table because I was awake. But that pre, you know, anesthesia, whatever the name of it is, it knocks you out, you know, a couple of seconds and you're out. So you don't even know that you're getting on the table. No, I, I'm OK. I, I'm fine. I will put myself on the table. Don't give me that medicine because I see and saw what it did to my mom. That is really interesting. Now, did you have to like fight them on that or were they? No, pretty? Oh, nope. that's good. No, nope. because I can see and they them. Know, they know that it does that to elderly people. Because I asked, you know, what in the world caused her, you know, to be this way? She had to have a back surgery. And they mm-hmm. said, oh, and some elderly people, this, whatever the name is, this pre anesthesia thing, um, it can affect them that way. Kind of like how a UTI will do an elderly person. And I'm like, no, mm -mm, don't ever, no, she doesn't need it. And and there's no fight. There's no fight at all. That's, that is like not the helpful information I expected to get today, but wow, I'm really impressed that 
we somehow stumbled on that piece of that <laughs> really helpful piece of advice. See that, like I said, I'm always learning something new and God forbid I have to have a different surgery. I got 49 and a half years in before I broke a bone. I had a baby. And then I had as a baby, a, ch- a young child, I had, I have lazy eye. And so they corrected it cosmetically. That is the extent of me going to the hospital. You know? Okay. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if we go another, you know, 20 or 30 years, I'll definitely be too old for that pre cocktail. And, <laughs> you know, and I'm not like, you know, I've had, as of today, I'm, all, I'm up to, I got a week to go for my second vaccine, but you know how they're always like, you know, they, they, I think they kind of like hesitate because they think you're going to flinch. It's like, yeah, just give me the shot. It's no big deal. Mm-hmm, <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm, whatever mm-hmm. I got to do to go someplace other than my town right here. I'm just, <laughs> I'm ready to get out of Brentwood and go someplace else, <laughs> which we're planning on, but I got to stand on top of my husband. So now the, what's the little guy's name again? The four, um, Jose? J- no, you're the youngest one. What? Oh, um, LJ. 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 Okay. So he's always pretty much. He doesn't know anything different than great no, grandma being he around. He doesn't know anything different. Nope. Do they interact? He doesn't know anything different. Do they interact? Yeah, they much? do. And yes, he will share his toys. You know, <laughs> Granny, this is your truck. Oh. You know, and I'm like, okay, but you know, because Granny is now where she will eat the truck. Oh dear. So, but he wants to share his toy sometimes, or he wants to share his snack, and you know, he there he's helpful. But he, that's what he sees in us. That makes so sense. So he's modeling what he sees in us. He doesn't see us being impatient or, you know, tossing her in a corner. No, she's a member of this family. And so he sees how we interact with her. And then he does the same thing. That's amazing. So I need to check back in with you in about 15, 16 years to find out if he's going to be a researcher or a caregiver, a nurse. I'm like, I'm kind of interested to see where this beginning of his life, how that sh- mm-hmm. might shape his adulthood. I'm like really mm-hmm, curious. Mm-hmm. I need a crystal ball. <laughs> 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 don't we all, right? <laughs> yeah, don't we all? Don't we all? And so do you, the, I'm, does the kids, it's like multiple generations, so it's hard to keep track. So the, your kids, do they hang out sometimes and have dinner, everybody together, or is that not mm-hmm. something? So it really is yeah. a whole giant team. It is. It is. It's a team. It's definitely a team. You know, um, like my, my one daughter's in California, but the two boys and their wives are here. And so sometimes we do, we have the big family dinners all here, or when my son comes over to drop the kids off, um, you know, sometimes have to ask him for stuff. I mean, just yesterday. Now my mom, she's at the point in this journey where when she's ready to go to sleep, she's going to sleep. Doesn't matter what's going on. I don't care if she's walking. If she's going to go to sleep, she's going to go to sleep. And I had to ask my son yesterday, can you please carry granny to her room? Do you think you can do that? And he's like, all the way up the steps? Like, (laughs) yes, up the stairs, but I think you can do it. He says, okay, no problem, mom. You know, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And he just picks her up and carries her up the stairs. Or, you know, when my husband, when we take her to the doctor now, I actually will, and I'll have the caregiver to stay here. And my husband will go with us to, because you can only take one person. So my husband will go with us to the doctor's office because he can more easily just pick her up and put her in the car versus the caregiver and I struggling to get her in the car. So, um, it's, it's 1000% a team effort. You know, it's like I get the brunt because I'm the daughter, but I'm not doing it all by myself. Do you find that even in advanced dementia, your mom knows how to push your buttons? No, Ah, no, my mom was now she did a few years ago. And that's when I thought, Oh Lord, can (laughs) I do this? A few years ago, if she thought I was one of my siblings, oh man, oh, she would just, she would turn into a different person. It's like, this is not the mother that birthed me. You know, she would turn into somebody else, but that lasted for a couple of months. And then she kind of, my mom has a very mellow personality, very calm, very sweet. And that was, you know, just a short period. And then she went back to being her mellow self. 
Well, that's good. My mom thought I was her best friend, which was interesting. It made it a little bit of a challenge because obviously we're not super huggy kissy with our best friends. Right. So mm -hmm. we had sort of like a, we didn't have like that super lovey relationship because mm. of that. That's where mm -hmm. she thought she, we were at. And I accepted it because there's not a lot other choice. But yep. she knew how to push every button, just like she did when her mind was fine. I'm like, I don't get this. Because <laughs> you would not push these buttons on your best friend. Not maybe, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. regularly. And I always thought that was so interesting. Like, there is mm -hmm. a part of her that knows who I am. Mm -hmm. And it's the, that's, the, that's the mom that's just going to needle me about every little stupid thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. See, at this point, my mom's um, my mom's use of the Eng English language is very minimal. So nothing really makes sense. You know, she talks a lot, but she doesn't speak in full sentences. It's kind of a baby babble. Mm. It's it's really sort of a baby babble. But if something if something in her mind is making her angry, then she can make a good sentence. But other than that, it's sort of a baby babble, and you know, she's just. Um, She's like a she's like a she's like a baby, really. And I've heard people get offended at that statement, but it's it's very true. Um, they do go backwards in time. You know, right now my mom has a lot of the infantile reflexes, the eyes getting big and the hands and feet, you know, she's got a lot of those infantile reflexes. So, you know, she's really at a different space right now. So she can't push buttons. <laughs> That's, but she was never a button pusher, so that didn't come out for her. That's the. That's good because I've heard people say, "Oh, my mom was so easygoing and with the Alzheimer's, and and she's like a totally different person." My mom was the same, but kind of amplified. Okay. And to your comment about you know, like your mom has a lot of similarities to a an infant or a really young child. There is, and it's hard to demonstrate audio, but there is like. You know, as they decline, there's like almost intersecting arcs. Like children learn and grow, and I don't want to yes. say improve, and they decline. And at some point, they yes. they kind of are on the same level as young kids. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not mm -hmm. it's not an insult or some sort of negative treatment of them. Right, you have to be where they're at. Yeah, it's not an insult at all. And I think the people that find it insulting are people who haven't walked this journey because they don't know that that's just the reality of what it is. Like I said, you know, Jose and granny, they really had a sort of friendship because they were about at the same space, you know, let's color, let's get our snack. We're going to get our juice box. You know, they were about at the same space. So it wasn't an insult. We're just kind of, you're, you're meeting the person where they are and you're caring for them the way they need to be cared for. My mom chews all the time now, chews constantly. It's like a teething baby. Well, that's a good point. So do I go, nope, she's an adult. I don't do, nope, no, she's chewing like a baby. So I found the, you know, most sturdy teething ring that I could so that she doesn't chew on her fingers. That makes sense. So that would be, it would be irresponsible of me not to meet her where she's at. I would. I don't. Th I don't think I've ever talked to anybody that's had that particular issue. That's really interesting. I think it's one a of constant our constant chewing. That must drive you ban bananas. You know, it's like, what am I supposed to do? Because I don't want her to, you know, her fingers to be bleeding, or because she's literally chewing. But you're chewing with the pressure of a grown woman. Yeah, with molars. Ooh, exactly. You have to wonder what it is in their brain that's causing that that need. That's really interesting. Yeah, we've we've I've asked the neurologist, I've asked the primary, and so it's like, let me figure out how to handle this. And the the thing that has worked the best is to give her just something that she can chew on other than her fingers, you know, or a towel, or you know, like a um, you know, like I bought washcloths, you know, give her a brand new washcloth and just let her chew it. Or put well, it in the freezer so it's cold. But because she can bite under her lips, she can bite her lips. She can, you know, I had blood on my finger one day and I'm like, oh, did I cut myself? And then I thought, no, go check her. She had chewed until her finger was bleeding. Ooh. 
And that could cause infections. That's actually, you know, people might not understand that that's, that's got, that's got some real medical possibility, you know, like she could get an infection, which, you know, in elderly people is just, that's the worst thing you can do is have any Mm -hmm. kind of infection Mm -hmm. because that's what, like the uh, adaptive clothing some of them mm-hmm. use Velcro, which is fine for some people, but other people, if the Velcro touches their skin, you know, mm-hmm. it causes tears in the skin and then they get an infection mm-hmm. and then, then we got all right. kinds of problems. And right. You, know, you just have to figure out what works for your person and not everybody goes through the same thing. And I guess maybe that's one of the reasons the doctors have a hard time as well, because not every case is the same, you know, because I don't know how many people that you've interviewed been, and I'm the first person to say something about this chewing. Yeah. I mean, I you don't know, know that so everybody goes through something different. I don't know that they haven't had that experience, but you're the first person that I can think of that's mentioned it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's oh, a, it's a constant here. <laughs> and like, I know a lot, I'm trying to think I've, there's something that's tickling the back of my brain about something. A lot of people, they just, I, they, they walk constantly. And so uh-huh. they, need to eat constantly because they're just burning tons of calories and that's always a challenge but yeah i i have been following the the mars rover perseverance because i find that fascinating but i seriously think our final uh frontier of exploration is actually the brain i think when they Mm -hmm. finally figure out more about our brains that'll be uh we'll be gone but (laughs) it's i think that's a long way off because it's just it's such a complicated organ and it controls everything and like so you, complicated yeah you like you were saying people don't most people that have not dealt with somebody daily with alzheimer's or dementia don't they just assume that it's just forgetting like they have like they lose their right. short-term memory it's like yeah no they forget how to breathe that's usually how a lot of them transition right. to the next world the gal that right. i was talking to this morning her mom went to sleep and didn't wake up and most likely, because her mom was in advanced Alzheimer's, her brain just forgot to keep breathing. And mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. not an ugly way mm-hmm. to go. Most of us should mm-hmm. go in our sleep. But it's just... Yeah, it's just, it's just you know, it's a, it's a horrible disease. And I'm really starting to think that it's a lot of lifestyle choices. I think they need to, like, stop trying to figure out how to clear the plaques and tangles out of the brain and figure out, like, if if they say... You know, originally they said, oh, well, you've got Alzheimer's like 10 years before you start showing symptoms. And now they've backed it up to where it's like, oh, okay. So if I have Alzheimer's, it started showing up when I was in my like late 20s, early 30s. Mm. I'm in trouble. <laughs> but like my grandmother, my paternal grandmother got to 103 and her mind was wow. fine. Yeah. You know, she couldn't see, she couldn't hear, which is not good for your brain. I think that is what I think. Once she was mostly blind from glaucoma and then she just became very hard of hearing. And I am going to have to talk to an audiologist one of these days, an ear doctor. I do not understand what it is about hearing aids that people are so resistant about Mm. because I cannot imagine living mostly blind and extremely hard of hearing. That's like solitary confinement in your own brain. Wow. That could not have Mm -hmm. been good for her cognition. Right. And so I'm, I'm just convinced that that was not definitely not a good thing for her. And I think she might've lived longer had, well, she had, she insisted on living on her own. So she was 102. Oh, wow. Yeah. My poor aunt, wow. my poor aunt got the brunt of dealing with her. She wasn't a caregiver like you are. She would take food and transport my grandmother, but. She 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 dealt with it for a long time, and she was mm-hmm. very very tired. Wow! Of it. But um, we lived with my grandmother for three months while our first house was being built, and the, I'm kind of sort of convinced the way she ate was not enough protein, and it may not have uh. actually been enough calories to huh. feed feed her brain. Wow! So wow! I'm, I really think mm. it's lifestyle and you know chemicals and. Just stuff. So I don't know. Mm-hmm. Maybe someday somebody will hear this and go, "Yeah, she was right." That podcast from way back. Because <laughs> <laughs> you said you immortalized your mom by writing a book, 
because we were not able to have a service for my mom because she passed away right at the beginning of the COVID pandemic Mm -hmm. hysteria. Not that I'm saying it was unnecessary hysteria, but it was at the beginning when nobody understood Mm -hmm. what was going on. Yeah. You know, we got past a year and still no nothing. Wow. So she passed away on March 31st, the last Tuesday of April in 2020. I did a tribute to her on the podcast. So my daughter mm-hmm. spoke on stories of my mom. My husband spoke of stories on his mom-in-law. A friend of my mom spoke. I did a little bit of intro, outro, of my own stuff. People know my story pretty well because I'm all here every week. And I'm really glad I was able to do that because, one, she's immortalized too, but also because I never got to have a celebration of life. Yeah. So Yeah, wow. It's crazy. It's this been COVID a- has changed so much. I think they're gonna, there's going to be some positives, at, you know, like all the isolation that caused problems with the seniors. I think they're going to realize that I think there's going to be positive changes that come out of the, the understandings of things that they did that weren't necessarily good. But, you know, they didn't mm-hmm. know what they didn't know better at the time. But now yeah. we, I think we're going to have a lot more data and material to research. It's like we kind of crammed it all into one year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And hopefully, you know, they'll they'll realize that isolation is bad. Keeping young kids away from seniors with this horrible disease is not mm-hmm. necessarily a good thing. I mean, that's like I said, my nephew, I'm not sure he can handle it, but, you know, he has his own challenges. So that's understandable. But like your grandkids, they're just they just roll with it. And that's so great. I yeah, just, I just love. Yeah, that. they just roll with it. You know, and I think, you know, maybe lots of times that they catch what we're doing versus what we're saying. Mm -hmm. And when they see you doing a certain thing, then they just, you know, it's like, oh, well, that's what you're supposed to do. That's how it's supposed to go. And so they just roll with it. You know, there's no um, pushback from it. And if there is a little bit of pushback, then that's okay too, because this is, this is new for them. It's unknown for them. You know, I'm learning. We're all still learning. You know, my mom does stuff and, you know, life is different every day. So, (laughs) you know, I'm still learning. So I can't expect them to be like, let me just do whatever you want. And I'm going to, you know, they're, they're great, but I don't force them or expect them to do anything. Whatever you want to do on your own is fine, but I have no expectation as far as that goes, because, you know, this, this is a disease that nobody ever wants and nobody, but, but it's in, you know, my mom has it. So it is what it is, but they, there's not an expectation for the kids to do certain things, but I love it that they do. Well, and probably not expecting them helps. There's no pressure. There's no pressure. And then I'm not disappointed because you don't. That's true. You know, I don't put the pressure on myself even. That's great. That's, and I think that's why I have no guilt. You know, because it's like, I'm going to do my best and my best is all I've got. I don't have anything beyond that. So I'm going to do my best. I'm going to lay it all on the table and hey, you're going to be good. You know, you're going to you're going to take this journey with us or we're taking the journey with you. But there's no guilt. There's no guilt. That's awesome. More caregivers need to understand that. Yeah, I just did, um, in addition to the Granny Needs My Help book, I did a a journal for caregivers, a guided journal, and there's like 50 questions to kind of help you stay centered. You know, it's like, you don't have to be on this ledge or that ledge. Let's find a, let's find a place in the middle. You know, you're, you're okay, honey. <laughs> you're okay. And I think for me, I have this philosophy to think on the lovely. That's how I kind of live my life. Think on the lovely. What is lovely? What is the good report? You got to deal with everything, but I want to know what's lovely. What is the good report? And that's where I'm going to focus. And so even with my mom, I would tell people it was not Skittles, rainbows, or roses. Don't bring it to her. (laughs) You know, she doesn't need to know about it because when you focus on the other stuff, that's when you feel guilt. I went to dinner and I wasn't with my mom. Oh, I feel guilty. I did this and I should have been, oh, now I feel guilty. You know, he passed and I was out at, you know, at the movies. Now I feel guilty. No, no. Think on the lovely. Think on the lovely. Like my dad, um, because I cared for him too. 
And my dad passed in between me talking to my brother on the phone and going to answer the doorbell. Mm. When I came back in the room, he was gone. I could have put guilt on myself. Oh gosh, I wasn't there when he took his last breath. He was in that room by himself. Oh, e, uh, no, I've been with this guy for 10 years. <laughs> I know I did my best. And I said, God, thank you for, for protecting me from that moment. Because maybe I wouldn't have been able to handle that moment. Maybe I would have had that in, ingrained in my mind. So I could have gone to the guilt, but no, I'm going to think on the lovely. Thank you for protecting me. That was not for me to see. You know, I was with him five minutes before that, but you know, that was, I guess, not for me to experience. So it's like, how do you find, and sometimes you got to dig to find the good, but find it, find it. I'm panning for gold there. <laughs> Pan for gold. It will make your life better. Pan I for gold. That. That's interesting because I've always kind of felt like I was not there when my dad died. I'd seen him a few days before. He got really verbally abusive at the end. So it was like I had to protect myself from that. Mm -hmm. And when the hospice people called, they're like, well, you know, they're coming to take the body, but we can wait if you want to come. I'm like, it's 1030 at night. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. I was I actually got the best night's sleep in three months after that. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. I saw my mom the day before she passed. They called and we we got there as quick as we could, but she left without us being there. And I don't think it would mm -hmm. have been any different than the day before. But I right. have not experienced somebody leaving as I'm sitting there. And I I don't think I want to. I don't want to. I don't want to. So I mean, I, like I said, I'm going to look at the lovely and I see it as a gift that that doorbell rang and I had to go down the hall and get the door. Maybe he was waiting for you to get out of the room. <laughs> maybe, maybe, you know, so I'm, I don't, I'm not going to give myself guilt over that. I'm saying thank you for protecting my heart. I mean, literally I walked to the door and we came back and the gentleman that was with me had come to see my dad. And I said, um, I don't see his chest going up and down. Oh. And the guy says, no, baby, I don't either. Mm. I don't either. Just like that. Just like that. That's but I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put guilt on myself. I know I did my best. And I say, thank you, daddy, for protecting me from that. Well, that's lovely. So we got grandkids that are helping and you're teaching people how to, to find the lovely. I love that phrase. I'm going to remember that. This has been a yeah. really challenging, like, 16 months since the beginning of 2020. Life has been really throwing me all kinds of curveballs. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm ducking mm -hmm. them. Ducking them pretty good. But, <laughs> man, I've learned some serious coping techniques. And then more and then more. <laughs> and it's like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, you sometimes just have to say, this is very frustrating. Great. We're going to not focus on that. That's that's where I'm yep. at right now is not focusing yeah. on all the stuff that did not happen, is not happening, and just focus mm -hmm. on what I can do to, to use your phrase, find the lovely. That's Literally. right. That's Literally. right. I mean, sometimes you got to, like you said, like you're panning for gold. <laughs> yeah, that's how, how 2020 was. It's like, you know, my mom passed away, everything closed down, you know, then the West Coast was on fire and it was like... Could there be like, when, when is the locust coming? was kind of my thought. <laughs> and our oldest dog was, he was my shadow, my stalker. And he got to his 13th birthday. He was doing quite well. Was pretty mm. sure that he wouldn't get to 14. But assumed oh. he would live to spring or summer of 21. And then uh -huh. he, something happened. He got, he turned 13 on November 12th. And we had to put him to sleep on November 23rd. So, and mm. then the state closed down again and our Christmas vacation to Yosemite got canceled. So I was like, I give up, you know, it's like, yeah, there yeah. are not enough coping mm -hmm. techniques to deal with all of this crazy. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. But then you just get up another day and you're like, okay, well, what can I do today? I don't want to wallow around in sadness and pity because yep. that don't feel yep. good. So no, I, I love your, I'm going to remember, I'm going to have to like put it on a t-shirt. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, we get a choice. I think I recognize that every day, every second of the day, I'm in choice. So I get to choose, you know, because it's our emotions that lots of times get us way off track. And so I get to choose which emotion I'm going to use to deal with this because I know the outcome that I want. So I'm not going to let my emotions be in the driver's seat because that's when I can get way off track. No, I'm in control. I choose the emotions that I handle this situation with. And we're going to go from there. Like, you know, like I said, with my dad or even, you know, with my mom, you can, you can definitely beat yourself up. Oh gosh, why did this happen to her? You know, she's got no quality of life. What is she going to No. All I know and I'm responsible for is that she has life. How am I going to help her live the best life that she can in the state that she's in? That's my job. Other than that, I can't change anything else. So that is what it is. You know, she, for a while, she would eat with her fingers and it's like, you know, and I could see that other people may be a little bit embarrassed. You know, see the people around her or I'm like, Hey, she's feeding that's herself. where she's at. She's still independent. Use your fingers. And one of her caregivers is from Ethiopia. And she's like, Debbie, she just eats like an Ethiopian. That's all. <laughs> I'm like, you're right. I I'm not realize. upset about it. I'm not embarrassed. It's where she's at. Yeah. It's a choice. You choose to be embarrassed. That is true. Yeah, no, I didn't. I never worried about mom eating with fingers. It was the fussing over the food that she would push off the plate. She would take a bite and three bites would end up on the table and then she'd have to clean it all up and then she'd take another bite and three. <laughs> it was, yeah. I called it her, uh, her Alzheimer's OCD. And yeah, that's a whole different phase. Yeah, yeah. That was not a fun phase. And it, no, that's not a fun phase. And it was hard. You know, it was like, I don't care if you eat with your fingers. I don't care if you're messy because I don't have a problem with my brain and I'm messy. So it's like, you know, that's kind of just a family thing. And, you know, it, I, I didn't worry about it. But yeah. it, the fussing over her, when she fussed over herself making messes, and I would just mm -hmm. say, oh, we all make messes. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. And then she'd get mad at me for mm -hmm. telling her not to worry about it. I'm like, okay, I give up. You know, <laughs> you can't, it's, it's like you can't win. Yeah. You, you can't win. Yeah. That's a, that's a different phase. I'm glad we're, we're beyond that phase, but you know, and all you can do is just let them be. Cause I mean, you, you can't win. Nope. And you it's, can't change it's their brain. Yeah. It's their brain. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. is the journal also available on Amazon? Yes, the journal is available on Amazon. I have three journals, as a matter of fact. Um, I have a journal for children, Ooh. one for boys, one for girls, and one for adults. And, you know, the journal for adults asks point, pointed questions. What have you done to celebrate you today? Um, things like, um, what, would it look for, what would it look like for you to be fully supported? Who is on your team caring for your loved one? Because we all need a team. Your team may not be your family members, but you need a team. It could be a hired caregiver. It could be a support person at the doctor's office. It could be the kid next door, but you need a team. Yep. So who is on your support team caring for your loved one? So the, um, the one for adults asks really good questions, you know, that I wish I'd probably known early on, but it asks really good questions for the caregiver. And it's, what is it called? So I can, I want to make sure it's hot linked in the show notes. It's called, I, I love the title. I said, I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to trademark this. <laughs> it's called dementia sucks, but life doesn't have to. I love it. We all and need it to does. That. Dementia does suck, but yeah, no life kidding. doesn't have to. <laughs> and see, and it just plays right into this theme that's been going on for me this week. And it's, I think it's going to continue is we need to find a way as families, as society, to help people with dementia and Alzheimer's yeah. live better with the disease instead of yeah. instead of reacting to the disease, maybe like what you're doing. It's like, this is where she's at. So I got her a teething ring. Okay, great. Yeah. And, you know, that's like we yeah. said, better than possibly causing an infection on your fingers. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. I, I, it will I, teach you how to be creative. You know, you, if you, if you see everything as a challenge and you get angry, then you're going to be miserable. And then you're going to have guilt because you feel miserable. 
But if you see things as a creative journey, let me figure out how to do it. Now it becomes a chance to solve a problem. How do I solve this problem? You know, mom used to pick everything out of those pull-ups. Oh, mercy. <laughs> so you get up in the morning and she's picked everything out of the pull-ups, all the cotton from the inside is all on the floor. You know, that's a, ooh, that's a whole nother story, you know, <laughs> but it was the alternative, um, am I using the right word? The adaptive clothing. That was the answer for that. But you just had to do some research and find adaptive clothing that zips up the back. So it's like, if you see it as a challenge, how do I solve the problem? Versus getting angry and, you know, your creativity and your patience will grow a lot. <laughs> that sounds like a perfect spot to end so people can marinate on that idea because I love that. This has been yeah. fantastic. And you can tell Jose, I did that right, correct? Yes. Oh, good. Like I said, I'm really terrible with names. I have a tendency to j jumble them up that I appreciated her talking to me. And Thank you. when I, I told my uh, podcast crew that I had to log off one Zoom meeting to talk to get ready for you guys and that the eight-year-old was going to come on, they were all like, oh, that's going to be so great. So <laughs> <laughs> not too many podcasters get to talk to kids too often. So, yeah, well, I really appreciate this. And like I said, the journals and the kids book will all be linked in the show notes. So you guys can just click on it. Check them out, order them, because they definitely sound like stuff we need to add to our library. And if there's a second book or a third or whatever, let me know, because I like to shout out these kind of these tools that only caregivers like us can create. Because we've Absolutely. Been there. Wonderful. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.